Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Colorado seminar. Today, we are very happy to have uh, Lawrence Lutens from Cambridge. And uh, he has done a lot of I mean, interesting, excellent works that I'm not capable of introducing. So let's just welcome Lawrence. Right. Thank you, uh, for the invite. And I, I want to talk a bit about some, some recent work that we did, um, but also summarize some work that actually has been going on in, in our group and maybe sort of the, the field of generalized symmetries over, over like a span of like 10 years, maybe. Uh, I, I want to kind of give our perspective on these generalized symmetries, so generalized symmetries or non-invertible symmetries and the kind of a whole topic and the whole industry working on this kind of thing right now. Um, but I think these tensor networks, they, they give you a sort of a unique way of looking at it. We have been thinking about these things for a while. So I, I hope to kind of summarize um, or give some intuitions of how we think about these things. Um, and then also provide a very practical application of these ideas for, for the very real problem of simulating um, strongly correlated systems, which in the end, at the end of the day, that's what tensor networks were designed for, is just to find ground states of so the motivation is, is that, okay, there's this thing called tensor networks, and I will explain a little bit what these are in a bit. Um, and they are the state of the art when it comes to finding ground states of local gaps Hamiltonians. I should add a little asterisk here in low dimensions. The kind of complexity of these algorithms really blows up very quickly with the dimension, but uh, certainly in 1 plus 1D, if you have a local gap Hamiltonian, there is very little that does better than the tensor. On the one hand, it is very powerful numerical tools. Um, on the other hand, they, it turns out, and that's more of a recent observation, is that they provide a very natural language for representing these, these modern notions of symmetries directly on the lattice. So, so symmetries and duality, that you can understand how these work uh, in a very explicit way, in a very algebraic way, using these tensor network. Uh, so there's a very strong numerical component and a very strong theoretical component, and sort of the conclusion or the, the thing I want to advertise in this talk um, is basically that there's a very non-trivial, that there's, a, there's a, a very interesting way to combine these things. Um, and namely, you, you can come to the following insight. So if you take some 1 plus 1, the Hamiltonian on the lattice, and it has some symmetry that can be a finite group symmetry like you're used to, or it can be one of these categorical symmetries, so it really does not matter. The point is that there's always going to be a dual model with some dual symmetry, and it will define what, this, what all these words mean, um, with some dual ground state that completely breaks the dual symmetry. So that's sort of a mathematical characterization, and okay, you could say that's nice, what's, what's the point? Well, the point is that this dual ground state minimizes the entanglement, um, so it, it has less, strictly less entanglement, or equal or less entanglement than, um, than your initial ground state. And it also provides you the, the optimal tensor network compression of the variational parameters in that ground state. So it just turns out that it's much more computationally efficient to find this dual maximal symmetry breaking ground state than it is to find the original ground state. So that's kind of the thing that I, I want to get. Yes. And this is for discrete symmetries? Uh, this is for, yes, let's stick to fusion category symmetries, so discrete symmetries for now. I can say a little bit about continuous symmetries uh, at the end of the talk, and there are some things that still survive there, but the picture is, is much less. I can be much more precise in the screen. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the result, and that's something that we, we sort of uh, recently did in, in this paper together uh, with my collaborators, Clément Delcan and uh, Frank Verstraat. What is meant by the word dual here? I will say exactly what that, I will define exactly what that means. I mean, okay, I can always say you now, it's some uh, equivalent realization of your, um, your Hamiltonian. So it's a, uh, a duality for me is a transformation that preserves the locality of my Hamiltonian, preserves the, um, the operator algebra given by my, my, generated by the terms of my Hamiltonian. Um, so it preserves local symmetric operators but it also um, takes local non-symmetric operators to non-local operators. So it's really dual in the sense of like the kramer one duality and its generalizations. If you're more of a high energy uh, oriented person, 
these dualities they turn out to just correspond to gauging uh, okay so sort of an overview I, I first want to talk a bit about symmetries and the using tensor networks as a representation theory for these generalized symmetries on my lattice. And to do that, um, I need to talk about how we think about symmetries and tensor networks, what kinds of operators we have. And the easiest way to do that is actually to talk about topological order in, in the tensor networks. This is something that's kind of reflecting this modern point of view that is very useful to think about symmetries of living on the boundary of some topological order. So this kind of sim TFT picture uh, is something that's also very natural on tensor networks and this kind of works uh, exactly the same way. I want to talk about some exact tensor network states. So before, like this bit here is going to just be about general tensor networks using them as an ansatz, uh, but imposing some symmetries on that ansatz. You can also, for some exactly solvable models, uh, you can find exact tensor network states, and that's going to sort of form the basis for, for like classifying representations of generalized symmetries. Um, then using these ideas for all about topological models, we're going to go down one dimension uh, do some kind of dimensional reduction by this idea of topological holography to study symmetries in one dimension lower. And then uh, at the end, I'm, I'm going to use this to, to argue and, and, and show you in a very explicit example that you can actually gain uh, computational advantage by, by, by understanding these things in this way. All right, so a little bit about tensor networks. So, so for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm apologize for those of you that, that kind of know what they are, but. That's when networks kind of situate themselves in the many body problem. What the, the, the idea is, okay, you have some state of many, many qubits. That's exponentially many complex numbers of information. So that's this completely computationally intractable Hilbert space. If I give you a Hamiltonian on 40 qubits and I ask you to be honest, it's a very, very difficult problem, a priori. Now what's kind of happened in the, in the 90s and early 2000s is, is kind of ideas from quantum information. Um, people argued that, that actually, many of the physically relevant states, and by physically relevant, I mean um, low energy dynamics of some local gapped Hamiltonian. Actually, those states have, have relatively little entanglement. If I take some generic state in this exponentially big Hilbert space, going to have quite a bit of entanglement. And it turns out that that's not at all what, what nature kind of likes to explore. That's not part of the phase space of, of, of local um, gapped Hamiltonians. So, so the kind of picture that emerges is that you have this exponentially large Hilbert space, but there's actually just a very small corner of physically relevant states. And that little corner is exactly what these tensor networks, they, they, they target this corner very precisely. Uh, so it's just to kind of give some names. Um, in one plus one D, we have something called matrix public states. They're sort of the oldest and, and the most successful iteration of these tensor networks. In higher dimensions, they are called uh, projected entangled pair states. Um, you can also write down operators, which is going to be relevant for these generalized symmetry operators called matrix operators. But I'll explain these in a bit more detail. So matrix product states are an efficient approximation to the ground state of a local gapped Hamiltonian. This is something that you can really just prove. So what do they look like? Well, you have some wave function here. I have some tensor product Hilbert space and I have some basis for the tensor product Hilbert space. This is J1 to Jn here. A matrix product state is a state where the coefficient um, of this uh, wave function, like the coefficients in, in express when in, in spaces is given by a product of matrices where these matrices, they depend on these particular um, physical degrees of freedom. So for every configuration of spins here, I have some matrices and the coefficient is given by taking a product of these matrices. And then because I'm on periodic boundary conditions here, I'm taking a, a trace. I don't really have to do that. It's just kind of the simplest thing to do. This is a very efficient way of characterizing um, translation invariant states. So if, if, if I just tell you to write some translation invariant state in an exponentially big Hilbert space, that's not so easy. This is kind of a very explicit way of doing it. And you see that there's a massive reduction in um, the required amount of parameters in this state. If I just had to specify a state in an exponentially large Hilbert space, I would have to give you a priori exponentially many numbers. In this parameterization, you only really have big D squared times small d complex numbers, and this completely specifies the state. Of course, this is only useful if these states are actually interesting state, but it just turns out that they are indeed. These states are, uh, they do represent this, this kind of, uh, this corner of Hilbert space of, of, of ground states of local gap Hamiltonians. Could you give us some intuition about why that is the case? 
It's because um, you can prove that the ground state of a local gap Hamiltonian satisfies an area law. And these states um, encode that area law very explicitly. So that's true in higher dimensions as well. Exactly. These get less effective. So, so in higher dimensions, the, I'm, I'm kind of restricting to 1D and, and need this paper also. It proves it for 1D. So for 1D, there's an actual proof. And OK, the area law is just some constant, right? In 1D, it's just a constant. In higher dimensions, the, there is no complete proof yet. And indeed, so, so when I say that this becomes more difficult in higher dimensions, that's more so about, that's more a statement about the variational algorithms over these kind of things. So it turns out that in 1D, these have a lot more structure that you can exploit in your variational algorithms. You have things like DMRG that work extremely well. In higher dimensions, we don't have that luxury. So even if in higher dimensions, and that's not proven, even if in higher dimensions, we could prove that these states um, visually approximate ground states of local gap Hamiltonians, that still wouldn't mean that there are efficient algorithms on top of these to find it. So what I said before was more a statement about the actual computational cost of finding these. This kind of notation very quickly gets very cumbersome. So we switch to this kind of graphical notation in which tensors are represented by balls with legs attached to them. Um, so for every um, index of this tensor, you have a little leg. And then whenever two legs are, two, two tensors are connected by a leg or contracted, you just draw the device of connection. So this, this thing is the same as this expression on top. Something that's obvious from this picture, but also from here, is that this state is invariant under this reparameterization. So if I just take this A and I do similarity transformation, this leaves the state invariant, obviously. Um, now, what's less obvious is that the converse is true. What I mean by that is that if you have two MPS tensors, um, so, so, so two states defined by MPS tensors A and B, if these two states are the same for any system size, this can only be true if the matrices that build up these tensors are similar. So in terms of the picture, this is what it means. This mm -hmm. is something that we call fundamental theorem of MPS. It's sort of the backbone of all the kind of theoretical derivations and, and, and what I'm going to say. So I just wanted to highlight this. It's not at all hard to prove this, it's just some application of Cauchy Schwartz, so it just boils down to finding the right inequalities to, to, to work this out. It's not so difficult. But it's a very powerful theorem. It has very, uh, you can really derive a lot just from this kind of one, one theorem. That's why I'm showing it. And so one application of this is the classification of symmetry protected topological phases in lattice models. So let's just imagine that we have some matrix product say, psi of A. Um, and say that it's invariant under some on-site representation UG of a group. Um, if you use your, your, the theorem I had on the previous slide, you can derive this kind of condition here. So this is just saying that if I take the state generated by this tensor A with the UG acting on it, it's the same as this guy, which means that there must be some X that kind of intertwines these, these, these two things. So from this, it follows that if you now do this twice, you find that X of G here, the similarity transformation has to be a representation. But it doesn't have to be a linear representation. It can be a projective representation. There can be a phase there. Because if you kind of do this on periodic boundary conditions or whatever, the, the phase will drop out. So there's a, an option to put a phase there. And indeed, uh, that happens. So you find that this X of G here is a projective representation. So projective representations are, of course, classified by second cohomology. And what this X of G here is, is doing in the end of the day is really just telling you that, OK, let's imagine that I have a kind of open chain of this MPS. I act with this U of G. I can push it through, and I get an action of this X of G on some edge degrees of freedom. But the action of that U of G on the edge degrees of freedom is, is projected. Right? So, and that's indeed exactly what, what kind of um, is telling you that, OK, that the action of the symmetry on the edge is anomalous. Uh, and this gives you the classification of, of SPT phases uh, with matrix product states. It's important to say that the kind of ones, if you look at the dates on these papers, it's like 29 and 2010. This is kind of the, 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 the first time that there was any kind of, of systematic understanding of SPT phases uh, in, in lattice models. So, so MPS and these kind of techniques that have been around uh, right from the beginning of this kind of stuff. OK, so that was 1D. There's a version in 2D, which is sort of obvious. If you have this graphical notation, you just draw tensors with more legs and you connect them. Historically, it was not so obvious uh, that this was the right thing to do. Uh, so these things are called projected entangled pair states because they first arose in some very specific model. Um, it's really just 2D tensor networks. And so we kind of use this funny acronym PEPS uh, just to mean 2D tensor networks, basically. 
Okay, you can play the same game in, in higher dimensions. So let's say now we have some, some state that's invariant under some group G. So we have this condition here. You can again use this fundamental theorem to obtain now this relation. So this is your initial tensor here with this UG acting on it. This is this is, well, this is just this equality. And your fundamental theorem tells you that there's kind of an intertwiner now, um, which instead of just being a matrix becomes this matrix product operator. So this red line here, this is what we call a matrix product operator. So you have matrix product states. Uh, you also have matrix product operators. This is again just an operator that's a product of matrix. And what's interesting about this is that, okay, you find that your physical symmetry is implemented at this, this matrix product operator, MPO, on this, this, these entanglement degrees of freedom. And you can extract an anomaly from this guy as well. That's going to give you a three co-cycle. So you get a third cohomology out of this. And that's indeed the classification of, of two DSP. So this was one and just a little bit after the, the, the one you came. Now, in 2 plus 1D, we get something that we don't get in 1 plus 1D. We get topological orders. And so what, how does that look in tensor networks? Well, you, you can actually have this kind of MPO symmetry without any action on the physical level. So here before, um, I had this U of G here. When I push this thing through, it kind of absorbs this U of G. I can actually already find tensors that kind of have this property without any physical action. Um, so the, these operators O of A here, these, these MPO symmetries, they're not required to be invertible operators. Um, they can be categorical symmetries. So these operators in general, you can derive that they are described by some fusion category. And if this happens, that means that this ground state has topological order orders. This topological order is given by the center of the fusion category that describes the symmetry. This is something that okay was done about like 10 years ago. Uh, so, so it was understood very early on that these matrix product operators, which are going to kind of feature uh, a few times in this talk, that they are sort of relevant in the representation theory of these categorical symmetries. You, you, these can completely capture all the non-trivial features of some categorical symmetry. But this is on the virtual degrees of freedom of some um, some, some <laughs> high dimension tensor networks. Okay, to summarize, um, kind of thing I want to, to emphasize here is that these tensor networks, they allow you to, to have global symmetry properties. Like, okay, do I have topological order or not? That's a global property. It's not something you can probe with local order operators. Nevertheless, with these tensor networks, you find that um, these, these global symmetry properties translate to local properties on the entanglement degree of freedom. I can locally check if my tensor has the symmetry, I can tell whether it has topological order or not. It's a local condition. Um, so some advantages of, of this way of looking at things are that, okay, for one, um, these, these virtual symmetries, they are purely living on the entanglement degrees of freedom. So I could imagine taking uh, this state here and, and kind of, let's assume that I have some correlation in zero state, I can add some interactions, I can add some, some finite depth unitary on top of this and introduce some interactions. Um, and those symmetries that will still survive, so the symmetries they don't get modified at all. So this really rep, like parametrizes um, the state and, and not just at the RG fixed point, but beyond that as well. That's something that will feature again later. And then another thing which is just comes for free if you frame things in the tensor network language is a very natural holographic interpretation. Um, there's kind of an inherent dimensional reduction going on in tensor networks where you go from some bulk to some boundary theory. That's what all the numerical algorithms do. And that dimensional reduction is kind of why, why they work so well in the first place. Like if you do this at 1 plus 1D, just you, you see that the algorithm basically what it's doing is sort of optimizing some, some effective 0 plus 1D theory all the time. And, and that's kind of easy to do. Yes? Is it really true that you can, given this local data, tell whether it has topological order Good. or not? Yeah. <clears throat> you could tune through some phase transition. Exactly. And like exactly. So, yeah, right, right, right. So, so it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient uh, condition. So you can prove that. So you, you could imagine writing some trivial product state with these MPO symmetries. So it's not at all. The arrow does not quite go both ways. It's kind of a necessary condition. You can, if you do something a bit more sophisticated than what I just told you, you can actually still check that it has topological order, and that's still sort of local, in that you don't need to compute some expectation value of some. <laughs> string order operator and yeah. you can just look at like a, a transfer matrix of this thing, which is, is effectively like a 1D thing. And then from that, you can compute whether it's topological order or not. So it's a bit more subtle than I, I, I mentioned it, but it is a necessary condition. You can show that 
If you don't have this property, you cannot have the project property. There was another hand, I think. No. Um, okay, so I talked a bit about just symmetries and and, and but now let's let's have a look at some exact tensor networks, like some examples of tensor networks. The, the kind of exactly solve the models I want to talk about are are the eleven men uh, the eleven men models. Um, so these are exactly solvable fixed point models for general non chiral topological order in two plus one dimensions. So you've never seen these things before. It's basically like it's the Tori code, but then uh, just sort of the most general version of the Tori code, if you like. Um, and so whereas the Tori code is based on on, on Z two. Uh, these general string models, they're based on something called a fusion category. Um, it's just kind of the, the most general mathematical structure you need to describe these topological models. So the Hamiltonian is just a sum of commuting, um, it's, it's a sum of two terms. You have a vertex term and a plaquette term, so it's very much like a, like a gauge theory. Um, what's important for the exact solvability is that this Hamiltonian is a sum of commuting projectors. So you have plaquette operators, they're projectors, Vertex operators, also projectors, but they commute. So all these operators commute with each other. And that means that it's trivial to find a ground state. Uh, you just have to find a state that is in the plus one um, eigenspace of all these operators individually, which you can do because they all commute. So it's easy to find a ground state just by taking some random reference state and then acting with the product of all these projectors, which will project into these plus one eigenspaces. And as long as you have something left after you do this, so you just have to make sure that this psi zero is not a kernel of any of these projectors. As long as you have something left when you do this, this thing will be a ground state. So what's kind of immediately obvious if you know a little bit about tensor networks is that this, this just gives you a tensor network representation. Because you can think of this product of all projectors as sort of a low depth quantum circuit. It's low depth because they all commute. It's not really quantum circuit because it's not unitary, but nevertheless, it's sort of the same, same idea. And that's acting on some state, which you can take to be a product state, will give you a tensor network. So this, this ground state, you can readily write it as, as a 2 plus 1 D tensor network or, or FEPS. So this is something that was done like very early on after the after the, the, the introduction of these, these, these string net models. Um, and indeed, you find that these states, just like I mentioned before, they have these MPO symmetries on the virtual computer freedom. So they do satisfy this necessary condition for having topological order, which is good because they, they have one. With this structure, does it matter that the only thing that you used was that you have Meeting projectors. Yes. So you didn't need to assume that it was stabilizer code. No, it's not at all. No. So the projection code. Just projection. And it's literally just you take some initial state here, which okay, you can take it to be a product state, and then you can actually write this this thing here as a tensor network operator. It's some tensor network operator acting on a product state, which gives you a tensor network state. That's really all you need. It doesn't have to be stabilizer or whatever. Yes. You also need them to be frustration free, right? Uh, otherwise, that product of projectors could be just trivial. Uh, yes. So, by okay, you just mean that it could be the identity operator. That's what you mean by trivial, or, or it, it means zero. It could be zero. Right, but if they all commute. That doesn't matter. Like, take for example, uh, icing model yes. on a triangular lattice, but a ferromagnetic interaction, something like that. So, ferromagnetic sure. interaction. But you cannot comp I mean, your neighboring terms, though. They all come, like, just ZZ term. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 okay. But okay. with anti ferromagnetic interaction. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Then yes, yes, yes. you cannot okay. minimize all the terms, like, keep the Sure, data. I agree. Yeah. yeah, you also need frustration free. Yes. Thank you. Um, right, okay, so so that's kind of giving you an idea of how to construct these, these different tensor network states. Now the question is, can you actually classify these different representations? So it turns out, yes, that you can. Um, and there's kind of two pieces of mathematical data that go into classifying a tensor network representation of a ground state. One is just the fusion category that defines the left and right model, that's sort of obvious, right? And then the other one is something that's called a module category. So a, all the distinct tensor network representations of the string and ground state, they are classified by a choice of module category. Uh, and this, roughly speaking, corresponds to a choice of, of this initial psi zero. So you can prove that uh, these are, they are one to one with all the possible distinct psi zero. It's not really saying much, I'm just kind of pushing things around, not really clarifying it. 
Um, one way to think about it of, of this module category is it's really kind of like a, it's a choice of gap the boundary condition but in time. And that's kind of what this tensor network uh, state is. It's just so you have your partition function, you kind of slice it, then you choose a gap boundary condition. That's what your state is. Um, so if you do this, so if you make these two choices, so this fusion category D and then a, a module category R, so this is R for representation. Uh, this determines this tensor network representation. You find that the MPO symmetries that this thing exhibits um, are given by a different fusion category, which is completely fixed by these things. For the experts, this is known as the Morita dual of D with respect to R. It just suffices that it's, it's something that you can compute. If you don't know what this means, it's just something that you can compute from these two things. And it can be different than this initial fusion category. So for instance, you can have a fusion category here that's the representations of the group. And this symmetry here could be the group itself. So more generally, this could be something like Z4. This could be something like Z2 times Z2 with some anomaly. But these things have to satisfy some conditions. Uh, this is a categorical symmetry in the sense that, okay, these operators, they form a representation of the fusion ring of that fusion category. And if you look at locally how the fusion is implemented, there's some F symbol and some associated, and this is all nicely encoded in the structure. Um, so this kind of tells you, okay, you have these symmetries and they act on these entanglement degrees of freedom um, that's determined by this, this kind of tensor representation. And this basically gives you the lattice representation theory of this categorical symmetry C. So you could turn it around. You could say, I fix some categorical symmetry C and ask, how can I represent this on a lattice? How can I choose my Hilbert space such that this symmetry can act on it and still have all its kind of correctly reproduce the associator of that symmetry? What are all the possible distinct ways in which I can? Yes. So when you say entanglement degree of freedom, what do you mean? This? I mean these. Uh, Is that the names sorry. that they give those operators, or no? no I'm, I'm, I mean these degrees of freedom here. So these virtual degrees of freedom that build on the tensor network. So I have these tensors. They have so this tensor has five legs. One of the leg is the is what we call the physical leg. There's the actual leg. That's the actual. I mean, this corresponds to some basis vector in the actual. I understand. Because I'm just saying the word entanglement means that the degree of freedom sitting on the link, or does yes. it mean? Is there is some sort of entanglement theory behind this? No, no, it just means there's degree of freedom sitting on the link. It's just a name, yeah. Because, I mean, the, the, the idea is that if, if they are trivial, then it's just a problem. No, state, right? So there you go. All right, so, so okay, just kind of, this gives you a lattice representation theory of this, 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 this categorical symmetry. All the different ways in which you can realize this categorical symmetry on the lattice, sort of, uh, given by this. All right, so talked about two plus one. Let's go down one dimension. Um, like this is sort of a hot topic, this SIMTFT construction of topological holography or whatever you want to call it. Um, I just want to give two ways of doing this in the tensor network language. And I think it's interesting because um, kind of give you a slightly different perspective and you can say some, some non-trivial things just by looking at them in this, this way. Um, so one way is to go from two plus one D to two plus zero. So we get rid of the time direction. The way we do this is you start from some level one ground state. You can map it to a partition function of a 2D stop MAC model. Uh, it doesn't really have to be stop MAC model. So, I mean, I don't, the Boltzmann both, both don't have to be positive, but okay, that's, that's for simplicity's sake, take it to be like that. Um, you just take the overlap with some other state. So you have this string and ground state here. You take some other states, which can be a product state or some other entangled state, whatever. Uh, and this way you will get a number. But if you look at it as a tensor network, uh, this will very naturally encode the partition function of some two plus zero D stop make model. So what I mean is you have this green thing here, which is your string and ground state. You can take the overlap with some other state. So this omega here is, I've taken it to be a product state. I draw it in black. So I contract my physical degrees of freedom with these black product states. What's nice about this is that this model constructed in this way inherits the symmetries from the string that model. And so I constructed a model in 2 plus 0 D with these MPO symmetries. I can construct stop MAC models with categorical symmetries using this. So for instance, if you look at the hard hexagon model, Baxter from like 50 years ago, has Fibonacci symmetry. You can prove this in this way. Um, so this provides you a systematic way of constructing uh, stop, mat, stop MAC models with, with a given categorical symmetry. If you just wanted to do the Ising model with the C2 symmetry, you would just start from the Tori code or something, but you can do more complicated things like that. One thing that's nice about this is that these 11-1 these ground states, they are fixed points, right? So they are, these, these are supposed to be 
So yes. So the previous slide. Yes. Does omega have to be a trivial state or? No, no, it can be whatever. Yeah. So the only thing. So yeah, whatever I put here, the thing that I get will be a um. Will have the symmetries, right? So that's the okay. point of this slide. Like okay. now, if you want this thing to be a critical stop Mac model, for instance, then it becomes important what you put. Uh, so, so the idea is that you can sort of think of this as, as a think of this as like a, a partition function. This is like an, a time evolution from this topological state to this trivial state. So there's a kind of a phase transition there. So you see that this has a chance of being critical, you know, the phase transition from this topological to this trivial state. If you take both of these to be a topological state with the same topological order, uh, you can prove that this will always be again, this can never be critical, just because there's no phase transition there. So that's kind of why we take product states directly because of this, this, this next thing here. So um, these 11 on ground states, they are fixed points, which means from a quantum information perspective that there should be some unitary transformation that you can do to this, um, to sort of coarse grain or fine grain this lattice, right? You just act with some entanglers or disentanglers. Now you can sort of see that you can disentangle certain degrees of freedom and throw them away and thereby go to a coarser lattice or you can run it the other way. You can add on cells and tangle them in and increase the size of your slab. It just, just means that, okay, there's some isometry that basically takes your ground states on, and I take it to be hexagonal lattice. That's the reason there's a three here. Uh, so your hexagonal lattice, your ground state on three end states. I act with this isometry, and I get the ground state on end states. Right? That's, that's sort of from a quantum info point of view, what it means for this thing to be a RG fixed point. And what you can do, you can combine this with the thing on the previous slide. So you define your stop Mac model by taking the overlap with some product state. And let's say that I have my partition function on three end sites. I can write it like this, right? This is just the definition that I gave on the previous slide. And now you can push out, pull out this isometry and have it act on this product state here. So you get this omega prime, which is just U times omega, uh, acting on this, this, this ground state on end sites. And this gives me the partition function uh, on a coarse grain lattice. This gives some kind of very natural uh, coarse graining procedure for these partition functions that actually preserve the symmetry. So it's some kind of symmetric RG. Um, what's nice about this is that you can actually classify the fixed points of this RG explicitly. So if this Z is to be scale invariant, you need that this omega is basically able to absorb this U, right? It just kind of cancels that. And okay, I should be a bit more careful with the number of sites here, but. It should be similar, it should be built from the same objects as the one on the coarser or, or on the final lattice. If you just look at this kind of classification, you find that you just recover the classification of, of, um, of fixed point models in two plus zero dimensions, which are known to be classified by, by Frobenius So That's for the gap case, but actually something that people have recently started looking at, and um, this is kind of cool, I think, is that you can also do gap plus CFD fixed points. So if you take the CFD data, you can actually construct solutions of this equation that as a tensor network, you require infinite bond dimension for this to work. You basically look at uh, like the OPE of the, the primaries and the descendants, and from the conformal blocks, you can construct tensors that solve this equation exactly. That gives you a way of discretizing um, the CFT in, in a way that is explicitly scaled in fact. I just want to mention this because I think it's cool. Um, Another way to go to the boundary is to go to one plus one dimensions. So that's more a bulk boundary point of view then. So the way this is done in tensor networks is you, you have your state here in two plus one, which is this green thing. Your boundary, like the, the, the entanglement degrees of freedom at the boundary here. So here there's no longer any state. So we have some dangling entanglement mm -hmm. degrees of freedom here. That's a very natural Hilbert space for the boundary theory. That's where your edge modes live uh, of, of the state. And so you can define states on this boundary Hilbert space. That's what these blue things are. So these are states in one plus one dimensions, matrix product states. Something non-trivial is that if you look at the, the norms of these states, so this Hilbert space comes with a very special structure. What I mean is that not all these states are orthogonal states. There's some non-trivial norm being introduced by just living at the boundary of this, this higher dimensional tensor network states. So, so states. I think the way you have to compute these overlaps is you have to kind of mediate it through the bulk. And then what that boils down to is that there's some non-trivial operator that's sitting here if you take the overlap between these two things. If you try to write down Hamiltonians for those boundary theories, um, you find that they are not really normal eigenvalue problems like you're used to, but you get these generalized eigenvalue problems. 
And you always get this when you, um, if you express your Hamiltonian in a non-orthonormal basis, you sort of have to fix this. Uh, and that's exactly what this, this N is doing here. This is called the generalized eigenvalue problem. It's something that people who do um, quantum chemistry computations do all the time, the way they do like, um, like hard to fog for a module for a molecule or something. If they, they take the hydrogen orbitals and they just express everything in that basis, that gives them non they, those those things they overlap a little bit, so they are not strictly orthogonal, and you just get a general eigenvalue problem. The nice thing is that you you trade there's a you, you trade the normal eigenvalue problem for a much more local generalized eigenvalue problem. And numerically, that's something that's typically much more stable than actually dealing with a, a less local normal eigenvalue problem. So it's the same thing here. What we can effectively get here is we get some description of this edge theory, which as a generalized eigenvalue problem is local. But if you were to try and transform this to a normal one, you would have to take an inverse of this n here. And even if this h edge and this n, they are local, the inverse of n might not be local. So this is kind of a way of doing non-local theories at one plus one, but thinking of them as, as local, as living on the boundary of some higher dimensional thing. And it's something that our tensor network algorithms can deal with with exactly the same cost as, 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 as a normal eigenvalue problem. Something that we recently used this for is, is, um, is, is it gives you a way to, to get around this, this Nielsen and Yomiya permeability problem. You effectively work with a non-local Hamiltonian, so everything is fine, but it really looks local as the boundary is using something higher than that. Sorry, so so here, uh, could you explain what is the boundary here over space? Is those blue dot or? Yes, yeah, so so this blue dot, this is a state in this boundary Hilbert space. So the boundary Hilbert space is spanned by all the different states I can put on these entanglement degrees of freedom. But that's why there's not all those states are orthogonal states because I have to, I'm gluing that onto my bulk wave function. So uh, there's some non-trivial norm there. And that's what this, this sort of picture is supposed to represent. So the, then the, the boundary Hamiltonian that H edge is uh, determined by the I mean, transform matrix of some bulk. No, I, so, so you, okay, you have to, uh, so a priority there's no Hamiltonian here. If you want a Hamiltonian, you have to perturb this bulk a little bit and then push that through the boundary and that becomes some term acting on, on your boundary. So here a priori, if you don't do anything in the bulk, you just have a trivial theory on the boundary. And then you add like one small perturbation in the bulk that you have to do with like the general perturbation theory that gives you some Hamiltonian like on the boundary. So could, could you explain again what, what what's the meaning of that picture? So this picture is just this one, I assume. Yeah, exactly. It's just you you have your let's say that this is infinite in all all the directions except for this one. You can just typically you can just look for the fixed point of this thing because it's infinite. So you get like a transfer matrix here. You can replace it by its leading eigen eigenvector, and that leading eigenvector is what gives you this thing. That's sort of how you think about that. Something that you can have very explicit. Right. Um, if you do this with these topological models, what you find basically is that you you, you have a way of constructing Hamiltonians with categorical symmetry. So that's kind of what follows from this uh, explicitly. We're going to go through this, this thing in more detail. The only thing I want to say is that, like a corollary of this is that you can actually prove that any Hamiltonian with a categorical symmetry can be obtained in this way. What I mean by that is that like, you know that if you take a Hamiltonian with an SU2 symmetry, you know that you can express that Hamiltonian as a sum of graph coordinate coefficients contracted in some way. That's the wing record theorem. It's 100 years old by this point. Uh, what this kind of machinery allows you to prove is that something holds for these categorical symmetries as well. If you give me some Hamiltonian and it commutes with this, Hamilton, with this MPO representation of a categorical symmetry, I know that I can recast it into this language um, and, and, and I can define something like generalized graph coordinate coefficients and then. I know that any categorically symmetric Hamiltonian has to be expressible in terms of these generalized Krebs coordinate coefficients. So this is sort of giving you a, a um, the property you use here is that there's something like a Schur's orthogonality theorem for these, these generalized symmetries. All right, um, that was symmetries. I'm going to talk a little bit about dualities too. Um, so, so duality, so I mentioned that you have these different astronautic representations that are classified by, by, by some piece of data called this, this module category R here, R for representation. Um, but you can imagine that you can choose different representations in different patches of your lattice. 
Then the question becomes, okay, how do I glue those together? And it turns out, I'm not going to prove this, but it turns out that there's some operators sitting there. It's again an MPO. And it's something that sort of intertwines our two representations. You can actually move that thing through your lattice and turn one representation into another representation. Um, and this is basically a map between these two pieces of mathematical data. Now, these two things are, are module categories. And so the, the kind of fancy categorical language for this is that this thing is a module functor. Um, if you don't know what this means, it's literally, you can sort of define it like this if you want. It's something that intertwines between these two root tensor network representations. And these things are what I refer to as S less, or what we refer to as dualities. So some properties of the things. It, it maps a local categorically symmetric Hamiltonian, but this categorical symmetry C1, to some local categorical symmetry symmetric Hamiltonian, where those categorical symmetries don't have to be the same. So I could have um, a model with some S3 symmetry going to some dual model with a rep S3 symmetry. Those symmetries are not the same. They are equivalent in some sense, but they are not the same. Um, another property that I require is because you might say, okay, maybe these, these dualities that are just finite depth circuits, right? Those do that. Those take any local operator to another local operator. We additionally require that these dualities, they take local non-symmetric operators to non-local operators. So that's sort of seeing, that way you can already tell that, okay, there's something, that the phases of the models on which you act is going to change if you act with the duality. Something that you know for the Kram Tromier duality. If you do Kram Tromier, you go from the symmetry to the symmetry broken phase. This just generalizes that and to the most general. Right. Yes. That's not a notation, but R1, you mean a representation of P by D matrices? So R1 here is a tensor network representation of the string that model uh, given by D. But as a mathematical statement, what is the representation of? It's, it's, it's a representation of this fusion category, which is, doesn't mean that it's some D by D matrix. It's it's something that comes with its own data. So just like to define a fusion category, I have to define fusion rules and F symbols. If I want to define a module category, I have to define action rules and mixed F symbols that mix with the F symbol of a fusion category. Yeah. So it's not a representation of an algebra no. or a group. No. It's something else. It's something a bit more than that. So part of it is, it is a representation of the fusion rules of the fusion category, uh, non-negative integer matrix representation of that, but it comes with additional data that's something like an associator. So just like a fusion category symmetry is not like a group or an algebra, something a little bit more. This module category is a little bit more. The thing that's different than just a normal representation is if you look at how symmetries act on lattice models, I have to tell you how they act on neighboring degrees of freedom. That's information that if you typically just specify a representation, you don't think of your Hilbert space as having some additional structure. Just think, oh, it's big Hilbert space. My group acts on this Hilbert space as some representation. And that's true for any dimension. Now, if you say that your Hilbert space has additional structure, so that's a product Hilbert space or maybe some constraint Hilbert space or whatever, there's additional data there. And that data is translated into these kind of module, the extra data of a module category. It's sort of the best high level overview I can give without going into more detail. But it's it's about it has to do with the fact that these these operators, these symmetry operators, they don't act in an on-site way, they act in some correlated way. And there's different ways in which you can act in a correlated way. That's exactly what this data is, is giving. That's the most high-level hand wavy thing I can give without giving a formula. Um, importantly, uh, which is maybe a bit uh, something that you, you're not used to is that you can actually make these dualities unitary. I should say isometries in general, but like make it unitary if you include that action on the boundary conditions. So something like kramer one you're used to the fact that, okay, this is, goes from a symmetry breaking phase to a, a symmetric phase. The, the, the ground state, the gender C doesn't match, so how can that be unitary? Well, it actually works out again if you also say that these dualities, they act on the boundary conditions as well. So Kramer-Joinier in particular would be able to take periodic boundary conditions to anti-periodic boundary conditions, depending on the charge sector that you're in. And if you also include that, then these things again are unitary. So they preserve the spectrum. The way to prove this is that this is some tube algebra thing, and these are C stars, so there's a very natural dagger in all these things. Um, you can implement these as low depth quantum circuits. By low depth, I don't mean constant depth, I mean not exponential depth. 
So you can prove that these things are at most linear depth. If you allow for measurements, however, um, which makes the whole thing non-unitary, you can actually do a lot of them in constant depth. And this is something that's useful in practice if you, the dualities are actually quite non-trivial operators. They're able to map states in a certain phase to states in another phase. And in particular, let's say that you want to prepare the cluster states, and you can do that with one of these dualities acting on the product state. If you can write that duality as a constant depth circuit with some measurements, that means that you have an efficient way of preparing the cluster state. This is kind of, these kind of ideas, they have been used recently to, to prepare like non-abelian anions explicitly on a quantum computer, for instance. It's a similar kind of set of ideas. Let me make sure I understand. So the setups, so I first have the input, uh, the, the symmetry, right? I first need to have some input MPO symmetry, for example, that C1, C2. Yes, yes. And that's D, uh, or that intertwiner is, is some operation that implements the, this uh, operator isomorphism. Yes, exactly. I see, I see. And uh, and how can I see like the, the boundary condition in terms of this tensor network? So you say that they are unitary when including like different boundary conditions. Yeah, so I didn't I didn't draw a picture for that, but if you have a boundary, like a, a, I'm really mean like twisted boundary conditions. So boundary conditions that are just symmetries, but that run vertically instead of just horizontally, then you can see that, okay, these boundary conditions, they can end on these things properly and you get something called a tube algebra. And a tube algebra uh, is a C star algebra. So there's some, there's a unitary way in which you can sort of find the irreducible representation of that tube algebra. And that basically gives you that these things are new. So we can really just prove this. Okay, that's sort of like the, the, the first bit of the kind of um, tensor networks are useful for categorical symmetries. That's sort of the, the point of the first slide. In the remaining 10 ish minutes, I want to briefly explain how we actually use these things um, in numerics, how we can use these very abstract ideas on categorical symmetries to actually make better, faster code for finding ground states of homotonies. So the idea is the following. So let's assume that you start with some model with a categorical symmetry. The gap phases of this thing are classified by a choice of module category, P, P for phase, over this symmetry. Right? This is something that was proven in, in, in these papers. Um, you can write these ground states because this is a local gap Hamiltonian as a matrix public state, and you really recover this kind of nice classification in terms of module categories. So kind of observation now is the following, that, that in some general phase, uh, if you look at what this symmetry imposes on the entanglement degrees of freedom of your matrix public state, is that typically you will find that there's some degeneracy being imposed there. The reason for that is that these entanglement degrees of freedom they have to transform as representations on their symmetry, as we saw uh, almost 40 minutes ago. Um, and if, if these representations have to be projective, for instance, that means they cannot be one-dimensional representations. There's no one-dimensional projective representations. That will give you degeneracies in what's called a Schmidt spectrum. So the Schmidt spectrum is what you get. If you look at the eigenvalues of the following uh, reduced density matrix, so you just take your chain, you trace out half of it, and you look at the spectrum. That's the entanglement spectrum. It's telling you how much the left and the right of your chain are entangled with one another. So symmetry imposes degeneracies on this entanglement spectrum. And this kind of, this redundancies means that, okay, uh, uh, degeneracy and entanglement spectrum means I need to take uh, an MPS with a bond dimension to accommodate those degeneracies, and that's expensive. How expensive is that? Well, if you look at something like cost of DMRG, which is, is the most kind of famous and one of the most successful algorithms for these things. The cost of finding a bond dimension D MPS approximation to the ground state is D squared for the memory, you just have to store D by D matrices, as D cubed for the time complexity, because you're diagonalizing D by D matrices in the algorithm. That's okay, that's expensive. You, you ideally would like this to not be too big. Um, now, one way of, re of reducing this is if you could somehow get rid of these redundancies, right? If, you, if we have these degeneracies in our Schmidt spectrum, degeneracy means that you're computing something twice, right? It's the same thing, it's exact degenerate, so it it's kind of feels like redundant. Can you somehow remove these redundant Schmidt values, Schmidt values while still keeping all the same information in the ground state? Uh, if you can do that, then you can really gain a lot in terms of computational performance. But how do you achieve this? Well, the whole point is that if you do duality, you can change the phase of a model 
while still describing a physically equivalent theory. So you can compute any correlation function in one theory, you can compute it in the dual theory. So in terms of computing, uh, it doesn't really matter which one of the duals uh, you, you, you compute. Uh, you can compute anything in one theory in any of its duals. But that doesn't mean that they're all equally easy. And indeed, it turns out that the main result of this paper is that for every one plus one D Hamiltonian with some categorical symmetry and some phase P, there will always be a dual Hamiltonian with a dual ground state that completely breaks the dual symmetry. And because it completely breaks the dual symmetry, a symmetry that is broken doesn't impose degeneracies on your Schmidt values anymore. So it minimizes the amount of entanglement you need to represent that state. But additionally, the, the, the tensors that go into parameterizing the state, they are unconstrained. If I have some state with some symmetry, it means that not all the parameters that characterize that state are independent. Just the, the, the equation that the state is symmetric imposes conditions on these parameters. But if that symmetry is broken, there's no conditions, right? So that means that all these degrees of freedom, these, all these variational degrees of freedom are independent. So, okay, just to kind of illustrate a bit what, what, this, what this means in, in the remaining five minutes. Let's take the following Hamiltonian here. So this is a very normal looking Hamiltonian. It's not some Hamiltonian you would associate with categorical symmetry. It's really just something that you could imagine that your, your unless matter friends uh, cook up. So this is like the Heisenberg model and you perturb it with some terms here that break the SO3 symmetry down to an A4 symmetry. A4 is the, 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 the group of orientation preserving symmetries of the tetrahedron. It's one of these platonic solid subgroups of, the, of, of SO3. So these latter two terms, they break that symmetry. The phase diagram of this thing roughly looks like this. This phase diagram is like 99% sure I, that this is not correct. Of course, these lines, they are, they are sketches, right? I'm not even sure that all these different phase transitions are correct. Um, I just did a very quick scan for the purpose of, of, of this talk, of this phase diagram, and that's so roughly what I got. The only thing that's really important is these three points here. I am sure that those are in, that point A is in the SPT phase for this A4 symmetry, B is in the symmetric phase for this A4 symmetry, and then C is in a D2 or C2 times C2 symmetric phase for that A4 symmetry. So here, there's some symmetry that's broken. Both of these are symmetric. This is SPT, this is not SPT. Right, so if you have a model with this A4 symmetry, the possible duals are, are classified by basically all possible ways to gauge a subgroup of that symmetry with potentially with some twist. So the duals are labeled by a choice of subgroup and then some choice of two cycle on that subgroup. So the dual models are labeled by rep psi of H. The original model is just, uh, well, it's kind of take a trivial group, don't do anything, that's, the, that's a, the original model. These duality operators, they are implemented by these MPOs and in our kind of graphical notation, they look something like this. So you have your original model here, expressed as a linear combination of Krebs gordon coefficients. And then you have this operator here, and then below you have these blue lines. These are your gauge degrees of freedom. And this is kind of telling you that, okay, you don't necessarily have a tensor for the Tilbert space. There might be some gas constraints living here. Uh, that's sort of what, what this picture is encoding. So very important what this, what this really is. The result is the following. So this is the entanglement spectra you get in all these different dual theories. So here, this is the original theory in this A4-SPT phase. And I did exactly as expected, you get this twofold degeneracy everywhere. That's because A4 has a two-dimensional, well, it has three two-dimensional projective representations. So your entanglement degrees of freedom have to come in pairs like that. And then you look at the entanglement spectrum of all your different dual theories, and you find that there's actually two of them that have less entanglement. So the entanglement is just sort of the, take the, uh, the von Neumann entropy, for instance, would be the sum of these eigenvalues, times the log of these eigenvalues, uh, so it's clear that here the entanglement spectrum kind of falls off much more quickly than in this original theory. Um, and this is because you've kind of done a duality and you've gotten rid of the SPT phase and you come to a, a symmetry breaking phase of that symmetry. Now, of these two, actually this guy here, if you look at the amount of variational parameters you need, you find that this guy has by far the least number of variational parameters you need. It's like, and compared to the worst one, it's, it's like a factor of five less, which in terms of, of computational cost is, is, is a huge deal. Um, and so indeed, if you kind of look at, at more carefully how this thing works, uh, you find that this guy is exactly the dual theory where all the dual symmetries are completely broken. Uh, that's exactly as we expect, because if there's no more symmetry anymore, 
then my MPS is free to do whatever it wants and it's kind of can make the best use of my computational resources. And okay, the picture is the same for these other phases. So this is a symmetric phase. Here you get some threefold degeneracies because the A4 has a 3D linear EREP. Um, and indeed, there is one dual model here, this guy here, where all the dual symmetry is broken, has the least amount of entanglement and the least amount of variational parameters for a given accuracy. And the same works in, in, in this phase. So sort of more generally, the idea is that, okay, you have some model with a categorical symmetry. There's always a twisted gauging of the subsymmetry that's preserved in the ground state of P, in the ground state P, uh, which gives you a dual model that completely breaks its dual symmetry. Um, so in this dual phase, at least one of the ground states will have the property that acting with a dual symmetry operator uh, maps it to an orthogonal state. That's sort of the definition for if you have a non-invertible symmetry breaking. For, for normal finite group symmetry breaking, it's sort of obvious what that means, but if you have a non-invertible symmetry, you have to be a bit more careful. Um, so all the order operators for this dual ground state will be local by definition because it breaks the symmetry completely. All the quality particle excitations will be domain walls. Um, the tensor network ground state description of this, this dual ground state is, is optimal uh, because there's no redundancies being imposed by the symmetry, both in your entanglement spectrum and on your variation. So there's really like a significant gain. Uh, it just takes less time to compute the ground state for this optimal dual model. I'm going to flash, well, not really go through this argument. So there's some kind of category theory involved in actually proving this statement rigorously. Um, kind of a nice sketch that you get from this is that there's there's various fusion categories in this game floating around, floating around describing various different things. So you get some kind of equivalences between the Hamiltonian or more precisely the, the operator algebra, your degrees of freedom, the, the fusion category that describes the symmetry. Those are kind of satisfy a categorical equivalence. And then there's some equivalence between the Hamiltonian and your quasi particles kind of mediated by the entanglement degree of freedom. And then, okay, there's some equivalent, the same kind of equivalent between symmetry, the phase, and the quality particle. This doesn't mean much without a lot more explanation, but it's just a picture to show that we have like a very detailed understanding now of how the entanglement organizes itself in some categorically symmetric phase. So this is sort of a generalization of, of what we know about edge modes for finite groups. And, uh, I'll skip this. So to conclude, um, the first part of the talk was about showing that these tensor networks, they give you a very natural toolbox for realizing and understanding these, these generalized symmetries and dualities in an explicit way on the lattice. So they give you sort of a complete representation theory for these things, which is what you like, right? If you're a physicist, you want to do representation theory. Um, and then, okay, the second point is that these dualities, they give you a way of reducing computational complexity for, for simulating quantum antibody systems. And this is sort of nice. I mean, there's, there's many works being done on these generalized symmetries, but um, at least from our point of view, it, it, until recently, it was not so clear whether these ideas would actually have some bearing on, on the things that we care about, like actually computing ground states on very practical applications. And okay, it just turns out that uh, this is the case. The outlook, obviously, uh, the obvious question is, can you do this in higher dimensions? As I mentioned, the computational costs kind of goes up quite quickly. Nevertheless, people do still do this. Um, it's just, we are very spoiled by one plus one D. It works amazingly well, so we prefer to stick to that. But you can do these things in higher dimensions. What you find is something that, if, you, if you're looking at the two plus one D easing model in its symmetric phase, it turns out to be more efficient numerically, computationally, to to do a one-form symmetry breaking uh, lattice gauge theory instead, which is a bit contradictory. You might think that it's more complicated, but it actually turns out that's easy. Um, what about gap system? systems? So okay, we have these kind of full pictures for gap phases, but what if you glue different gap phases together and you go through a phase transition? What happens there? How does that work? Um, and then all of this was for global symmetries, right? But phases of matter are not completely classified by just global symmetries. You also need lattice symmetries, reflection, things like time reversal, um, lattice translations. Is there a way of incorporating those lattice symmetries in this sort of picture as well? That's kind of an open question. All right, but then uh, thank you for your attention. Yes.
actually, I'm going to raise Luca's question again. So, can you say a little bit about what you could do for what would go, what would change in the continuous symmetry case? Yeah, good. Um, so, all of these things are, are very topological arguments. Um, now, the problem is that for continuous symmetries, it's in one plus one D, the Merman Wagner theorem tells you you cannot break continuous symmetry. Now, there are there are situations where this stuff still goes through. If you're in the symmetric phase, some SU2 symmetric model, stick to satisfy the spin one half Heisenberg model or whatever, um, in its symmetric phase, then that then the optimal way of doing this is to indeed just gauge that symmetry, go to some dual theory, where you now have a rep SU2 symmetry, which is a non-invertible symmetry, uh, and you will be in the complete symmetry breaking phase of that symmetry. That's the optimal way of doing it. And if you if you just look at from a tensor network point of view, what it boils down to doing, this is exactly what people in tensor networks have been doing for like the past 20 years when they exploit SU2 symmetries. Really what they are doing, the way they are doing it um, boils down to going to a, a dual theory where you have this rep SU2 symmetry that's completely broken. So that stuff still goes through. Now, the, the full picture becomes more complicated because there is a thing like the Berman Wagner theorem. And, and the way that's proven is a very, it doesn't really fit with these categorical notions. You need a little bit about the dynamics. Like, okay, for instance, if you take a Hamiltonian and you have an order parameter that commutes with your Hamiltonian, that Berman Wagner doesn't really apply. You, you really need that they don't commute for that proof to go through. Um, all of those things are additional ingredients to this very topological symmetry point of view. So there's some additional ingredients you seem to need if you have a continuous symmetry. It's a similar thing here in, in two plus one dimensions. So um, these, these kind of dual models that you get, they have these closed loop symmetries and it's not just the non-contractible ones, it's also the contractible loops. And it seems that they are also broken but that then is in contradiction with Eritzer's theorem, which tells you that you cannot break local symmetries. So there's some tension there, and there's some aspects to this that I think we're still missing when it comes to... Also, yeah, the, the way you prove Eritzer's theorem is very similar to the way you prove the, the, the merman wagner theorem. That's why I'm, I'm not talking about it. So it seems that there's some missing ingredients still if you go to the full generality, uh, to the full general. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. So, is there a simple relation between a theory and uh, uh, I, I gauge the theory so between? I mean, between the entanglement spectrum of these two theory. For example, starting from yeah. So, so okay, I have this operator here. So, so oh, well, okay, you can. I know exactly how to relate all these different entanglement spectra because. These dualities themselves, the ones that relate these different entanglement spectra are just MPOs. And so if I'm computing this entanglement spectrum, I know how to map between them because uh, I can include this MPO in the computation of the Schmidt spectrum. So I basically, you have to sort of take every eigenvalue and then that's sort it with the eigenvalues of the actual MPO. That's sort of, that's where you get the doubling of, of eigenvalues. Like I can make a picture that explains it very nicely. I just didn't include it. So uh, the point is to make this gauging as an MPO. Yeah. And then I can and then decompose you like both the MPO and the state. Exactly, exactly. And so you see how the, the Schmidt values of the state are modified by the Schmidt values of the MPO, basically. We get a nice explanation. There's no border question like lessen the speaker. Again.